When you can fire neurons, you control memory pathways. So you can begin to insert memories. You can begin to alter memories. You can begin to delete memories. You can incentivize smells. You can incentivize movement. You're taking some pretty fundamental aspects of humanity. And there might be one or two ethical moral implications to all this. Creature on Earth until last year was made of four base pairs of DNA. So every mosquito, every plant, every orange, every sheep, every human being was made of these four base pairs. As of last year, you can swap out two of these base pairs and you can make creatures with XY instead of AT. And what that means is you suddenly create a parallel evolutionary track which potentially can make viruses or plants or animals that mate with nothing on Earth, that evolve on a completely parallel structure. And as you're thinking of those structures, what it basically means is the argument is that life turns out to be code. And so in the same way as you code with ABCs, in the same way as you code with ones and zeros, you code with life. And if you code with life, then you write sentences with life. And as you've been seeing in the CRISPR talks, or in the evolution talks, or in the biochemistry talks, or in the biotech talks, in essence what that means is you can rewrite sentences of life. And if you can rewrite sentences of life, then you can build great big coding centers. And that's completely changed biology, right? Because if you think of biology and how it was practiced, oh, 30 years ago, you had a whole series of biologists with microscopes, you had a whole series of biologists with little pith helmets looking around for plants, looking at barnacles, looking at fishes. So they were observing stuff, they were cataloging stuff. And biology was basically reactive, right? It's how does a plant grow? How is this a different species? And, and they were observing stuff. It was almost an outgrowth of Linnaeus or an outgrowth of Darwin observing a process. And what's happening today is the new biology is proactive. It's not what can I observe, it's what can I make. And when you make things that are alive, that changes the rules of the game in an absolutely fundamental way because science used to be about discovering and now it's about creating. So you're writing the sentences, you're not reading them. And in the measure that that happens, what it does is it's flipped evolution completely on its head. You're editing, altering, inserting, and deleting. And maybe you're not just gonna do that with body parts. Maybe you're gonna start doing that with memories. Because it's not just the human genome we're decoding, we're also beginning to decode the brain. And we're the only species that thinks of how it's programmed, right? No other butterfly sits there and thinks, why am I programmed to migrate from here to here? There's no sheep that's sitting there saying, why am I programmed to like eating grass? But we really do think about why are we programmed this way? Why do we feel this way? So we go to the psychotherapist to get reprogrammed, right? Some people say, this is unnatural, this is dangerous, this is X, this is Y. We certainly have to consider the ethical, moral, legal implications of work that fundamentally alters life code. Ravi said in the earlier segment, not to play God. And that's really what I wanted to do, I wanted to play God. Um, Nietzsche said, if there were gods, how could I bear not to be a God? And that's a line that resonated with the person that I was. Kierkegaard said, if I ask you for a glass of water, even if you bring me a better drink, I'll be indignant just because you didn't give me what I wanted. And that's what I really want. That, those are quotations that characterize where I was. And the justification that I had erected to be able to play God was rationalism. I had assumed that faith was blind. I had assumed that reason and faith were contradictory. Well, scientism is you know, the idea that as science continues to explain things, we no longer have any need for God as an explanation. And uh, last weekend, I was actually on a debate show, uh, a BBC debate show called The Big Questions. And underlying the whole discussion 
on that show was this assumption that science disproves God. And if you could have seen me, I was just bouncing up and down on the edge of my seat, trying to get the moderator's attention to, to let me in to say something. One of my professors at graduate school, John Warwick Montgomery, used to say, whenever you get onto a train of thought, make sure to check your ticket to see where it's going to get you off. <laughs> and these isms have got tickets that have not been checked. The logical outworking of these is systemic contradiction. And when an idea is contradictory, it cannot possibly be true when two statements are mutually exclusive, unconditioned. So we look at humanism, scientism, and look at the strengths of them. What, what were the nobler sides of those? They were not, they're not ill-willed to start with. But if it is taken, you know, I, let me put it this way. When you move through the isms going back across uh, centuries, you know, from rationalism to empiricism to existentialism and to postmodernism, all of these, the mistake that was made is that in grabbing the finger of one way of interpreting reality, they thought they were grabbing the fist of reality. These were single uh, ways of testing truth. You're writing about scientism as one of the isms listed here, seven or eight that you have. Acquaint us with scientism as it is a god of this world. The regularity of the universe. The fact that the universe does proceed in patterns, in ways that are regular and scientifically Einstein explainable. said the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is its comprehensibility.